You're hanging out After Hours with Matt Anderson, presented by Inside the Gamecocks. Welcome in to the Late Night Gamecock Show. I am your host, Matt Anderson. Very happy to have you here today. Um, unfortunately, you know, the Gamecock men's basketball team lost in the NCAA tournament on, I think it was Friday, uh, to Oregon. Maybe it was Thursday. I can't remember. But it, it's a tough loss. I know the Gamecock fans overall are hurting. But at the same time, you know, where the Gamecock started this season and where they finished the season was was still a storybook, storybook type ending. Uh, the Gamecocks obviously couldn't get it done in the tournament, but Oregon was a Pac-12 champion. It was a team that had Jermaine Cruzenard, who played at South Carolina a couple years ago under Frank Martin, and it just never seemed like it was the Gamecocks' day. And we're going to talk a heck of a lot more about um, men's college basketball and and you know what this whole, whole entire season looked like, and you know what it was like in the NCAA tournament, and we'll, we'll get that we'll get to that a little bit later. But what I like to do at this point in the year and the season of sports is we now have to flip our attention from college basketball, which you know a lot of Gamecock fans haven't paid attention to college basketball outside of the women for a long time. So um, Gamecock excitement was at another level. Um, and but it's time to flip back over to baseball season. We got spring spring football starting up soon, and I kind of feel like a lot of Gamecock fans need to get a refresher on what Gamecock baseball is doing right now. Uh, right now, Gamecock is Gamecocks are actually playing Presbyterian College. But if you need a quick refresh right now, uh, the Gamecocks are ranked uh, 18th in D1 baseball, 10th in Baseball America. 14th in the USA coach USA Today coaches poll and 18th in perfect game. That is an average ranking of 15th in the country. Gamecocks are 19 and five overall. Um, they're also probably going to be 20 and five overall after this game against PC finally concludes after the rain delay. Uh, they're four and two in the SEC. Have a home record of 16 and one, a road record of two and three, neutral record of one and one. Uh, key wins, they did beat Ole Miss on the road last weekend, and they swept Vanderbilt, who at the time was the number three team in the country, at um, Founders Park over the weekend. Gamecocks won those games 8-4, 8-3, and 10-2, so it's not like there was a lot of doubt in those games. Gamecocks thoroughly dismantled um, a really, really, really good Vanderbilt team. Uh, looking at key losses for those of us that are catching up on baseball, uh, Gamecocks lost to Belmont 11 and two. Those kinds of things happen. Um, not too worried about uh, a loss to a, a mid major there. Uh, Clemson, Gamecocks lost two games to Clemson. Didn't get the opportunity to play Clemson at home. Both those games were five to four defeats. Um, the one in Greenville, I think, or no, it was in Columbia. It was at um, I think Segra Field. Um, it was five to four in twelve innings, and the Gamecocks lost five to four at um, at Clemson on Sunday. Uh, Gamecocks did beat Ole Miss um, and lost to Ole Miss twice, so that's kind of where things stand right now. The last time I saw it, the Gamecocks were up like fifteen to five against Presbyterian College. Uh, there was a rain delay, so even though the game started at six thirty and it's nine thirty or nine twenty four right now. Uh, Gamecocks are, are well well in, in hand for a victory there. Uh, Michael, good to see you. Um, Tyler calls his batting stance is exactly like Matt Olson and Kenny Jones has grown on me. We still have baseball, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. We still have baseball. And, and look, you know, for forever, Gamecocks have hung their hat on baseball. So, so excited for that. Linda, good to see you. Uh, Michael just told me that it's 17 to 6 now. Yeah, when Phil and I were getting ready for the show tonight, we kind of said, like, okay, let's go ahead and call it. There's a little bit of rain coming down. It's after five innings or whatever. Me and Phil were debating it. Phil said five innings. I, I didn't know if it was five and a half or six or, or whatever. The, the rules seem to change all the time. But, yeah, it's probably about time to call this game. I know Ethan Petri got another – got two more dingers. Um, Kenny Jones has at least one, maybe two, two home runs tonight. Um, so Gamecocks are rolling. They're going to make it six in a row. 
Um, really big. They're they're going to Alabama this weekend, and Alabama is is no slouch. Uh, we'll have plenty of that on Inside the Gamecocks going forward, especially with um, Jamie Bradford, John Whittle. I mean, those guys know know baseball so so much better than I do. But I will definitely tell you my thoughts on on all of that. Um, I did not pay much attention. Um, Oh, Phil has just told me the run rule is seven. Okay, so yeah, Gamecocks are up 17 to six now. Um, after seven innings, I guess the coaches would have either talked about it before the game or they'll just make a, a snap judgment to say, let's call it. I would imagine this, this game gets called here pretty soon. Um, so really quick, going back to Gamecock baseball, I'm just going to give you guys a quick – Quick refresher, I know everyone's been in basketball mode, but the Gamecocks do have one, two, three players um, batting over 300 on the season. Dylan Brewer at 346, Kennedy Jones at 333, Ethan Petrie at 325. Um, as far as hits leaders go, and all of this is you know going into the game tonight, Dylan Brewer with 28, Ethan Petrie 26, Talmadge LaCroix 24, Cole Messina, 24, Parker Norland, 23, and Kennedy Jones, 22. You can look at RBI leaders, Cole Messina, 25, Ethan Petrie, 21, Dylan Brewer, 17, Gavin Casas, 17, and Kennedy Jones, 16. Then home runs, oh my gosh, Ethan Petrie has 10, Cole Messina has 9. About what you would expect from those two guys, and I guess make it um, a dozen for Ethan Petrie at this point in the game tonight. And if they don't call it, Ethan Petrie might hit five more. I don't know. Uh, Cole Messina has nine. Kennedy Jones, um, Tyler calls. He has four. Dylan Brewer and Gavin Costas have three. Like I said, this was all done before the game against PC tonight. So those numbers might have changed. Uh, team batting average is 276. Team on base, on base percentage is 443. Uh, team walks. The Gamecocks have <laughs> earned a ridiculous number of, of walks. Uh, Gamecocks, Gamecock batters have walked 187 times and been hit by pitches 48 times. So when you look at the Gamecocks strikeout numbers, uh, Gamecocks have struck out 221 times coming into the game, but 187 walks and 48 hit by pitches. I'm going to do the math really quick because it's my show and I can't. Um, I should have done this earlier. I apologize, but 187 plus 48. So <clears throat> Gamecocks are either getting a walk or hit by pitch. Um, a little over one, one, it's 1 1.06 times they actually strike out. So that's how you get a 443 on base percentage. Uh, so really excited for the Gamecocks are doing, you know, the, coming into the season, I thought that the Gamecocks would be largely reliant on their bats. And the Gamecocks have had big games, big opportunities, um, big everything at the plate. But I think that for for my money, at least, when you look at where the Gamecocks kind of started the season and the, and the opponents they played, the, the, the opponents didn't throw strikes. So they were just getting hit by pitches. They were taking walks. They, they really didn't have an opportunity to kind of get into the zone um, for, at the, at the batter's box and look at what they did against Vanderbilt. I think that that was, you know, elite pitching, elite hitting, um, just Gamecocks are, are doing, doing pretty, pretty well there. Um, but, you know, like I said, like I thought coming to the season, it was going to be all about the bats for the Gamecocks. And it's kind of turned into all about the pitching for the Gamecocks. I know that when we started this season, the the large conversation around this uh, pitching rotation and the bullpen was, well, the Gamecocks have a lot of Saturday, Sunday guys in the SEC, but they don't have a Friday night guy. Well, Eli Jones has an ERA of 2.35. He's 2-0. Pitched in six games this year, uh, 30.2 innings pitched, only giving up 27 hits, 23 strikeouts, only seven walks, and has not given up a home run. So, I think that the Gamecocks will be be okay. I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not too worried about the pitching staff going forward. I think that they have found guys in on the mound, 
and they have obviously the hitting chops to compete with anybody in the country. So uh, Gamecocks are about to make it six in a row, which is really exciting. Uh, before we dive into Gamecock men's basketball and what the future holds and recapping the season, all of that, I do want to make note that the Gamecock women's team are in the Sweet 16 for the 10th consecutive year, or maybe it's 11th consecutive year, but they are just absolutely demolishing the competition. <laughs> Um, they, I can't remember who they played in the first game. I think it might have actually been PC. And then they destroyed North Carolina um, to get to the Sweet 16. So the Gamecock women's team is rolling. I know that all of Gamecock Nation wants to have a rematch against LSU. Um, not that the Gamecocks need to be worried about that after winning 16 in a row, but after everything that happened in that SEC um, women's basketball tournament, I know that the Gamecocks would love to shut LSU up another time. And then every team in the country wants a shot at Iowa and Caitlin Clark. I do hope that the women Gamecocks get an, or the lady Gamecocks, women Gamecocks um, get an opportunity to do that. So a lot of stuff going on in Gamecock world. And I haven't even talked about spring practice from the football side of things. It's um, it's an, it's a really, really fun time for the Gamecocks and, and looking at the big if you're not a member already, I would encourage you go ahead, you know, take the plunge. It's nine 99 a month. They have deals running all the time. Uh, JC, who, you know, from inside the Gamecocks, uh, you know, from the big spur, you know, from his time at rivals. I mean, literally the godfather of Gamecock football had a ridiculous drop yesterday so if you want to hear about everything spring football wise uh, if you want to hear about recruiting stuff Hal McGranahan from the Big Spur just dumped so much information last night and um, the VIP room VIP room runs every Monday night sometime between like 8 and 9 p.m. Uh, it's the best place to get Gamecock information and the second best place to get information is Alex Jones because Alex is a part of the Big Spur, and every article you read is written by Alex Jones. Uh, I know he contributes to uh, the VIP room, contributes to so many things all over the bigspur.com, and I'm happy to bring him in after this word from our partners. I said, oh, Lord Jesus, it's a fire. Ain't nobody got time for that. Emergencies and accidents happen. When you're in the middle of a fire or water event, all you want is for things to return to normal as soon as possible. Resto Pros of the Midlands is with you. RestoProsMidlandsSC.com. Open 24-7 when you need them. Quality that is guaranteed. Down here in the South, we don't always see eye to eye. While our taste in college football teams or what sauce, if any, goes best on a rack of ribs or what to mix with our Dixie vodka might be up for debate, we can all agree there's nothing better than a Southern tailgate. And like our favorite college teams, our ingredients come from small towns and big cities. They're grown in Southern soil, are crafted by Southern hands, and proudly represent the South in our backyard and beyond. So raise a glass of Dixie Southern Vodka to celebrate being made in America and raised in the South. Oh, man. The building is on fire. During and after natural disasters or accidents, there can be a heavy loss to property. Resto Pros of the Midlands is here to help. Open 24-7. Call them when you need them. 803-493-0170. RestoProsMidlandsSC.com. Quality that is guaranteed. Well, we have Alex Jones. Um, I hope you're dry, Alex. I know you were at the game a little bit earlier, and that rain delay was nothing, nothing to um, have to deal with, actually. <laughs> no, funny. it was coming down it's pretty good for a little bit. Yeah, and I've been waiting on this rain in Florence all day long, and it hasn't seemed to come. I know the next two days look pretty rainy, and I was talking to Phil earlier, and 
he said he got it in Greenville. So I was I was wondering if they get this game in tonight, but they're gonna do their their darndest, I guess. Yeah, that rain it probably lasted a solid fifteen minutes or so, and ended up leaving the stadium in it. But it ended it ended fairly quickly though, and I guess then they got the tarp on fairly quick, so didn't take them long to get back going. Yeah, absolutely. I think the Gamecocks by. I don't know. I mean, Michael, what's the score? I know you were updating me. Last I saw it was 17 to 6. Um, Ethan Petri has two more dingers. Um, Kennedy Jones has at least one. I don't know if he I, I know he hit Phil told me he hit one. I thought he might have hit two. But anyway. Um, so did you go to Pittsburgh for the NCAA basketball tournament? I did. I was there. How 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 was that? That was that was a fun experience, you know. Even though South Carolina was only there for one game, it was still an enjoyable experience to be there and kind of experience what an NCAA tournament's like. Yeah, as a media member, I've, I've heard they're pretty strict on what you can and can't do. Was it? It was probably a little bit different than Colonial Life Arena. Yeah, they are a little bit strict, but uh, you know, I kind of wish our the South Carolina game was at four, and then that Oakland Kentucky game was right after the South Carolina game. I kind of wish I would have stayed for that after knowing what the score was, but. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, I don't blame you, man. Get back on the road. You got stuff to do. Um, so the big news out of men's college basketball right now is Michi Johnson um, declaring that he is going to transfer and test the NBA draft waters. Uh, you know, for me, Alex, and I know you were on this beat as well. I had heard some rumors about three weeks ago that Ohio State might be working Michi to a certain extent. Um, as far as I know, that that's his likely destination. But at the end of the day, he he was far away from home. He and Michi's had some personal things that he's dealt with, and he kind of had a, a rebirth in South Carolina. And right now, when you look at the transfer portal, like I don't think that you can actually get, you know, too comfortable with players being here year over year. Right. Yeah. I think just with the way it is, like you honestly never know what the roster is going to look like after a season. And I think that's just kind of the day and age we're in now. But, you know, for South Carolina, you know, Lamont Paris and his staff showed that they can rebuild a roster after a season. So, you know, I, you think they would be able to do it again coming up. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't mean to call us a big spur or a big, um, big deal last night on the big spur. But I, I kind of posted and said, look, you know, Michi's gone. He he might come back. You never know in, in this day and age. But at the same time, if you don't think that Colin Murray Boyles, if you don't think Zach Davis, Jacoby, Josh Gray, all these guys have an opportunity to go somewhere else, you're just kind of fooling yourself. And I wasn't I wasn't saying that the Gamecocks are on, you know, portal watch with any of those guys, but the numbers that I'm hearing from even mid major guys right now is is unbelievable and look are these kids actually going to get the money that they're being told that they can get i don't know it's all about the collective and how the collective is run and you know what opportunities that exist for for these guys uh, at their next school but look every single player morris you suck is going to have an opportunity somewhere if he wants it and it's just the era we're living in and i i, I kind of hate it um but at the end of the day you know, game like Lamont Paris, like what you said, like he made he made his hay on transfers at Chattanooga. He has he, he has this game figured out. He has a system that he wants to run and he has a way that he likes to recruit for the transfer portal. So I, I made the point on, on the Big Spur yesterday that there are going to be 200 to 300 guys in the transfer portal that can make a meaningful difference for South Carolina. And I'm being long winded right now, Alex, but I want to get this out. Michi Johnson was a transfer guy. Talon Cooper was a transfer guy. Josh Gray is a transfer guy. Um, you can go on and on and on down the list of players that have been successful at South Carolina. Hayden Brown was a transfer guy. That There are going to be opportunities for South Carolina, and every team in the country is dealing with this as well. Right, yeah. South Carolina's not the only one that's dealing with these transfers. And I think, what, there's like 200 or so, or maybe more so in the, in the port already, like – there's a lot out there. And like you said, you know, Michi was a transfer. So, 
you never know what they're going to be able to find in the portal and what the roster is going to look like next year. Yeah, there's there's going to be over a thousand kids in the portal, and there are going to be guys that I mean, Dalton Connect came to Tennessee from sorry, but nowhere <laughs> like junior college to a mid major to Tennessee, and he was just SEC Player of the Year. I guess I just want to urge Gamecock fans not to live and die by this transfer portal because there are players out there, and I know that there are some mid major guys that the Gamecocks are throwing their hat in the ring on and they're, they're getting after it right now. And look, these mid major players are actually probably more likely to be successful than a freshman would be. And I've talked to college coaches and I've, you know, just heard some rumblings and I've said this, this is at least the third time I've said it on some type of public show, but there are a lot of, you know, power five coaches that don't want to recruit a, high school senior that is outside of the top 60 in the country. Because if you go recruit a guy that's 60 to 300, whatever you want to call it, you're going to develop them. They're not going to be ready to play. And then someone else is going to take them from you. So why don't you just go take their players? And it's an interesting time for, for college basketball. I would actually be really interested to see, you know, 10 years from now, how many of these players that transferred multiple times actually earn their degree I'd be interested to see what these players are doing if they're playing professionally after a transfer or two, but mostly two transfers. I I go back to when I was in college, Alex, and if I had transferred two or three times, take away the college basketball side of it, but I'd be making new friends. I'd be adjusting to a new campus. I'd be taking new classes, new professors. I wouldn't have any like groundedness to what I was doing. So Long term, I hope the NCAA changes this, but where we're living right now, this is just the way it's going to go. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, kind of sticking to what you said about transfer and how if you were in that spot, like me being one who doesn't like change, I can't imagine just like jumping three different schools, like just kind of hard to fathom that. But, you know, just kind of the days we're in right now. Yeah, but I think Lamont is really smart with the way he's going to handle the transfer portal. He is going to look for guys and say, this is the role I have. This is the opportunity that you have. And he's going to be honest. If he's looking for a 16 point per game score, he's going to say, look, I need you to be 16 points per game. or I need you to be 15 or 12, whatever it is. I need you to be a, you know, I'm looking for you to do this. Do you want to do this in South Carolina? And it'll be interesting to see what happens. I mean, I, you've lived through a couple football transfer portal windows. You've lived through a couple of basketball transfer portal windows. I think football is a little bit more difficult because, you know, when you're talking about 22 guys on the field at a time and, you know, offense, defense, you know, classes stacking on top of each other and losing, you know, potentially 20 or 20, 25 guys a year, it's a little harder. Now, like if you lose eight guys, in college basketball, and I'm not saying the Gamecocks are. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that it's a lot easier to find five to eight guys that you can rely on year over year and in, in implementing your system. So not worried about South Carolina. Um, you're going to see this throughout the country. But I do want to go back to South Carolina's season because, you know, I see a lot of dismay in Gamecock fans right now, which is understandable. Yeah, you, fi- you finally get back to the NCAA tournament. The last time you were there, you made it all the way to the Final Four, and miracles happened. But a miracle did not happen this year. Um, you know, I thought the Gamecocks had a pretty good opportunity against Oregon. I think that, you know, like we've seen a couple times throughout the season, kind of like that last 10 minutes of the first half was detrimental to the Gamecocks. Even with Talon Cooper hitting a shot that is going to be on one shiny moment, it's going to be on there. It's going to get played. It was a, a big time shot. Um, I think that Oregon was probably just a little better than South Carolina. If you look at the computer metrics and I, I look at the computer metrics all the time, it was, it was a pretty close matchup. And, you know, I, I hate to say that, you know, these computer metrics are right, but they're pretty daggum good. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, Sticking with the Oregon game, you know, they were just a hot team at that point, had run through the Pac-12 tournament and played pretty well. And then you get to that game and, you know, 
Jermaine Kusnar just had a heck of a game. I mean, scoring 40 points. And I remember thinking about uh, Infali Dante having, I think it was 22. And I remember thinking, like, it was almost like a quiet 22 points, it felt mm-hmm. like, you know, because Kusnar was such the story of that game. But, you know, I didn't think South Carolina offensively played all that bad. I mean, they, I think they made, what, 10 threes or so? But, um, more know, than that, I'm about to pull it up right now because I'm on the same track as you. Yeah. And, you know, just thinking about that game, you know, when Kuznard and Dante combined for 62 points, like, you know, you kind of got to tip your cap and say, give them credit. Yeah. And, and look, you know, when these, when these players on different teams around the country, when two people combine for 62 points to, to your point, Alex, it gets difficult. It's like, Oh, let those two guys have theirs. Well, if they're getting 62, they're getting it anytime they want to get it. Um, you know, it's funny looking at this game. I got the box score up right now. Um, so the Gamecocks actually got 26 rebounds. So they got out rebounded by five. Um, I always like to see, you know, the Gamecocks out rebound their opponent. But on the flip side, they only had 11 turnovers in the game and they shot 11 of 24 from three. If you had told me going into that game, the Gamecocks would go 11 of 24, 45.8% from three and only have 11 turnovers and only lose the rebounding battle by five, I'd say, all right, okay. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. The kind of going uh, into that game – oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just thinking that kind of going into that game, the question was, can South kind of make the shots that they need to? And they really did. It's just, you know, Oregon just was just a little bit better. When you score 73 and you have Dante and Cousinard – combined for 63 <laughs> that's just a, that's a tough that's a tough one there because you know you pretty much kept everybody else at bay um you know jackson shellstad who i think is gonna be a phenomenal point guard i think he's really good he's only a freshman um he scored 11 points but after that uh, you had three points eight points and two points so only six guys scored for oregon which <laughs> yeah that, that's obviously you know a difficult situation but look, you know, it's not every day that someone puts a 40 burger on you. And I mean, I think that I saw that Jermaine Cousinard was the first player in NCAA basketball history in the tournament since they expanded to be a double digit seed on a team as a double digit seed and score 40. Um, I'm pretty sure that Jermaine probably sent a text message to Frank Martin after the game saying, hey, man, I got you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, it was it was tough for the Gamecocks, but look, you know where the Gamecocks started this season, being predicted to finish last in the SEC, to get to a six seed in the NCAA tournament, I thought that they potentially had a case for a four or five seed. Um, I, I don't like the fact that this year um, the selection committee decided to put um, the playing games as ten seeds. I don't think that's fair for the entire bracket. There's no reason. That, you know, if you're a six seed, you should be playing a team that traditionally should have had to play a game two days prior. Um, that's tough, but it's what they did this year. Um, yeah, it's just tough for me, man. It, it, it's, it's a tough loss. It's a, it's, it's a tough way to end the season. But looking at South Carolina, you know, I think Ken Palm is the gold standard. And I will say this to my grave. Um, I'm going to give you some numbers um, real quick, Alex. And for all the people that said the computer metrics are stupid, the computer metrics don't mean anything, the computer metrics hate the Gamecocks. Well, guess what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 of the 16, sweet 16 teams were ranked in the top 17. On Ken Palm. Wow. That's, so, that's pretty good. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I always say this and look, you know, the last team in there is NC State, 53rd in the country. Um, some might say that, you know, they had a, a, you know, relatively easy path to the Sweet 16. Granted, they've won three games now on top of the five games they won the ACC tournament, another team that's hot. But, I always say that Ken Palm, you know, doesn't do a great job. And I shouldn't say this that way. Ken Palm does a really good job of telling you who the top 10 teams are in the country at any given point. 
they, 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 he does a phenomenal job. His algorithm, you know, proprietary stuff, right? Like, I don't know how he does it, but he, he freaking does it every single year. I think that outside of one year, I've lost 11. If you looked at his preseason top 10, one of those teams won the national championship. So I, I, I like Ken Palm. I think that, you know, this, this season, like with the Gamecocks being out of the NCAA tournament, I think that basketball fans are in for a good Sweet 16, Elite Eight, Final Four, um, National Championship game. Can't wait for all of this. But looking at where the Gamecocks came from, Ken Palm had them ranked 66 in the country to start the season. Gamecocks go 13-1 and one, or no, 12-1 and one in the non-conference. The only loss is a five-point loss to Clemson. Well, guess what? Clemson's in the Sweet 16. Do Gamecock fans want to see it? Nope. But, yeah, you lost by five on the road to a Sweet 16 team. Outside of that, you lost to Alabama. You had a you had a halftime lead there in the Sweet 16. You had a loss to Georgia. Obviously, the Auburn loss is, is difficult to kind of stand when they got beat by 40 and then got beat by 31 in the SEC tournament. Look, if Auburn and Yale play – 10 games on a neutral court starting tomorrow. Auburn's going to win nine of those. It was just a, it was just a bad day for Auburn. Um, don't know why, don't know how, but they lost. And outside of that, you know, the Gamecocks lost by one to LSU. You and I were at that game together watching it. The Gamecocks had a double digit lead, let it slip through their, their fingertips. But then you have a loss to Tennessee and Tennessee's a sweet 16 team, mm -hmm. Oregon, Oregon, you know, made it to the second round, beat the Gamecocks, and gave Creighton everything that they had. And, you know, overall, overarching this entire season, I think the Gamecock fans should be really, really happy. What's what's your thoughts on that, Alex? Yeah, kind of going back to what you said earlier, it, there weren't many people who thought that South Carolina would be making its way to Pittsburgh to play in the NCAA tournament at the beginning of the season. You know, yeah, it, it was – if you're – a South Carolina fan, it was disappointing to lose in the first round, but to go from 11 and 21 in year one to being a six seed in the NCAA tournament in year two, I, I think that's a huge step forward for the program. And, you know, Lamont's talked about this, you know, the next step is now sustaining that success and keeping it going, you know, so we'll see how they can do. But I mean, it, I, in, in my opinion, I think it was a huge success for South Carolina this year to, get to where to finish how they finish. It absolutely was. And you look at the roster next year. Um, obviously you have um, uh, Deba who announced his transfer today. Michi Johnson's going to you know move on somewhere else. Maybe test professional waters. You lose BJ Mack. You lose to Cooper. But outside of that, they've, they've returned a lot of this core, um, most notably Colin Murray Boyles. And look, I think that, Every bit of information that I've gotten is Colin is locked in South Carolina, locked in with Lamont. You know, he's he's going to get paid, y'all. <laughs> he's going to get paid. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about that. But, you know, looking forward to the next year, you have Josh Gray, you have Miles Studi, you have Zach Davis and Jacoby Wright and Colin Murray Boyles kind of making that nucleus. Um, Morris Ugasuk, I think, is going to be a really good player in time. And... You have Trent Noah coming in. You have Uga Sucks, um, teammate from Finland who's coming in, who's who's played really well in his United States tour. And then you have at least, what is it now, Alex? You might have the math better than me. You have at least three scholarships to give to transfer guys. Yeah, I believe that's right as of this moment. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, when you look at what South Carolina probably needs, as of right now on the transfer portal, you need to find your next Talon Cooper. I would think kind of that point guard one, you know, what he did for this team, he was the key to this team this year, just with, you know, his ability to run the offense. So I think that's got to be one of the top priorities, this transfer portal cycle to see if you can find, you may not find, you know, somebody who was just as good as he was, but you may, but you got to find somebody along those lines. And then, you know, replacing BJ Mack, I mean, Losing his ability to stretch the floor and, you know, knock down threes and keep a defense honest, like that's key to find something along those lines in the portal as well. 
Yeah, there, there, there's a couple. There's a couple of guys that are out there in the transfer portal right now that I think would absolutely be just plug and replace for BJ Mack. Um, I think you can find plug and replace for Michi Johnson. Uh, Talon Cooper is the one player that I don't know, you know, how the Gamecocks find. Yeah, I, like like you said, like find another Talon Cooper. Well, that's that that's hard, and it's yeah. not like Talon was the leading scorer. I mean, I'm sure he was a leading assist guy. I would have to imagine. Mm -hmm. um, probably had the least turnovers of any guard on the roster. Um, it's going to be tough, but Talon Cooper came from Moorhead State, then he went to Minnesota, and then he came back to South Carolina. So there are guys out there. I think that you know Lamont is pretty good at you know mining the portal, and I, I would just urge Gamecock fans not to get caught up in you know, whatever recruiting website gives the transfers like star rating, like don't get caught up in that because, you know, Lamont's found a way to do it. Um, one of the guys that I'm really excited for for next year is Zach Davis. I think he has the opportunity to be an all SEC guy. And I, I, I don't say that lightly. I think that you saw flashes this year um, that, you know, they don't make six, seven, six, eight, 190, 200 pound guys that can jump out the gym, have the athleticism that Zachary Davis does. I mean, getting Zach, you know, you always say like, you know, lock him in the gym and make him shoot 500 threes or whatever. And, and that, that can potentially happen. But um, I think that he, you know, if you listen to Coach Paris talk, Colin Murray Bowles is not going to take threes this year. He said, hey, look, you know, you're not going to do it. But guess who was allowed to take threes? Zach Davis. Guess who never got benched? Zach Davis. Right. So, you know, when you look at if you look at that and you look at what his trajectory could be, and he seems to be very locked into the Gamecocks, South Carolina kid. I think that, you know, if you look at it next year, Jacoby Wright, 6'2, you know, kind of undersized, maybe never gonna be, you know, that all-star, all SEC, you know, point guard but a guy that can be a really good sixth man or fifth mm -hmm. man in the rotation. You have Miles Studi has SEC experience all over him, has shown moments. He's been – I thought Miles Studi did exactly what we wanted Miles Studi to do this year. And then you have Colin Murray Boyles. You have Josh Gray. You have such a great nucleus to build off of. And I, I think that Gamecocks are not going to be picked last in the SEC next year. That's one thing I can promise you. The media is not going to pick the Gamecocks to be last. But, you know, just let all the dust settle because there is going to be there's going to be a lot of transfers. You've already seen it at Auburn. Um, you've already seen it a couple other places. I think that Missouri is probably going to have some transfers. I think that Kentucky um, not going to have transfers, but they're going to have to reload. And we'll see what happens with John Calipari. Um, you know, things that I've heard about John Calipari is like Kentucky wants him out. John Calipari wants all $33 million that's owed to him. Um, I would look out for SMU with John Calipari if if um, things don't work out at Kentucky. Um, but but yeah, I think this entire season should be celebrated. I think that you know you still you're still following the women's team right now. And Alex, um, are you did you go to any of those NCAA tournament games? No, I was not there, uh, but I watched both of them. But I was not. Yeah, so like, like, they're just dismantling. That opponents. first half right. against North Carolina was something else. That was unreal how well they played. It felt like everything they were shooting was going in. And oh then my just gosh, defensively, yeah. they were all over North Carolina. And and North Carolina, like I don't want to say like they they were a sneaky like Final Four Sweet Sixteen team in the women's bracket, but there were people saying that North Carolina could give South Carolina some problems and. That was obviously not the case. I'm looking to women's basketball right now. I think that there are two teams that South Carolina fans want to play again. And I think it starts with LSU. Um, I, I got to look at the bracket. I don't know when they could possibly play LSU. Um, it, it would have I to be. I think it's Final still the national four. championship. Yeah, Final Four national championship. I don't know when they could play Iowa, but I can promise you right now that if South Carolina plays Iowa in the women's basketball tournament, it will be the most viewed game in women's college basketball history. And um, when you look at, you know, websites like the Big Spur, there are a lot of people that are getting a little sick of this Caitlin Clark stuff. And, you know, I'm kind of in between. I'm in between, man. Like, 
what she does is ridiculous. I think that, you know, it's probably the closest to pistol Pete we've seen in the, in the freedom she has to do whatever she wants on the court. But I, I would love to see the lady game or the women's game Cox play against, um, against Iowa. Um, baseball's heating up. Um, we got, um, you know, on a six game win streak, um, Phil is giving us updates. It is 17 to 11 in the middle of the eighth of the Gamecocks baseball game. So uh, PC's gotten a little hot here. Um, they've scored, what is it, five runs, six runs since we last updated that. Yeah. Uh, that, that could be a little bit of just trying to get the game over with. <laughs> I feel like uh, that could be what that is. But men's, uh, well, not men's, but Baseball, baseball is heating up. Really excited for the Gamecocks to get a sweep over Vanderbilt. Um, oh, Rob just said that LSU and South Carolina can meet in the Elite Eight. So that would be a lot of fun with the Final Four, final four berth on the line. Um, really quick, Craig, I'm kind of looking at these comments now. Um, I, I don't know, and this is Rob as well, what are the chances that we get to see Hero at the one and Ellis at the two? Um, maybe down the road, I, I don't think that Eli Ellis is going to um, reclassify as of right now. Um, it's being explored. There, there's an opportunity for it. But I think that um, sometimes you get high school kids that want to stay in their class. And I totally understand that. Um, yeah, with with Hero, uh, he, he's going to he can shoot the ball. I'll tell you that. You know, I was at the Garden and Black Madness event and he, he can stroke it. The game's still a little too fast for him. Um, as of the last time I saw him, but you know, they always say that you make your biggest jump from freshman to sophomore year. So maybe he can get involved. Maybe um, Trent Noah can get involved as a freshman, but I think that you're going to yeah. see the Gamecocks pretty active in this transfer portal. Um, that's about to pop up. Um, but Alex, have you been to any spring practices on the football side of things yet? Yeah, we went to one, the first one last Tuesday and, we went straight to Pittsburgh after that, but we were there at the practice field for that. It's always tough. And I always try and remind people that, you know, going to these practices as media or as a fan, you know, Steve Spurrier opened it up and you could just hang out on the sidelines and watch mm -hmm. practice. And, you know, he was, he was pretty good about putting the offense on the furthest side of the field where you really couldn't see what they were doing, but it's even harder right now to go to a practice and, really get any discernible information. I mean, you're going to get more information in these players' press conferences, which I know you've been a part of, talking to the coaches. Um, what you can get from going to these um, practices as a media member is just looking and see, like, how big how big is this guy? How, you know, what does he look like physically? Does he look the part of an SEC player? So, Alex, you know, when you were at, when you were at spring practice, what was, the, what was the look of the guys? I thought they looked good. You know, the one guy who immediately stood out was Dylan Stewart. Like, for being a true freshman, that guy just looks, you know, I'm not going to say ready to play day one, but, like, he just looks really good. You know, that yeah. was the big thing that caught my eye that first day of spring practice. Yeah, I mean, I've been hearing some good things about the Gamecocks wide receivers. Obviously, there's a lot of transfers that are that are going to be a big part of the rotation. Um, you know, I was talking with – um, Phil and JB and JC and um, they had Brad Crawford on and they talked about Nick Harbor kind of missing this time in the season. And I said, look, you know, Nick's missing it. Yeah, but he's getting really fast right now. I can promise you that. And the second thing is he has a lot of scout team work and second team and third team work with Lenore Sellers. So, you know, potentially that that will probably be OK. They probably already have a repertoire that's been built up together. But um Gage Larvadin, is that how you pronounce it, Alex? I believe so. Yes. Yeah, I, I, he's some. He's a guy that that's been turning heads. Um, I think that the the Brown kid from Coastal Carolina has an opportunity to be pretty good as well. I think Nick Harbor's coming along well. Tyshawn seems to be just becoming a really good sophomore. The the downside of spring practice, I think I read today, was Juju's out for the the rest of the spring. Um, Juju McDowell, that is. But I think that's a great opportunity for the two transfer running backs to get more and more reps and figure out what they're doing um, in the Gamecock offense. I don't think that's really a downside thing. I think, you know, cornerback, and we'll, we'll have a whole preview later, but um, 
you know, I think the offensive line is going to show some more tenacity um, based on what Sean Elliott's going to help Lonnie Teasley do. And, you know, just overall, Alex, what's your take so far on everything you've heard, everything you've reported on Gamecocks through, what is it, four spring practices? Yeah, I think they had the fourth one today. Um, but, yeah, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, we're still months away from the season, but it's going to be interesting to see just kind of how it all comes together. You know, you got a new quarterback for the most part. I mean, obviously we saw flashes of Norris Sellers, but you got a new quarterback. You got like a reloaded running back room, some new wide receiver faces in the room. It's just going to be interesting to see how it all comes together. You know, they some of the players, you know, talking about how excited they are to see what they can do this season. You know, I guess we'll see. We got about a whole month. Uh, just about a month left of spring practice for the Garden Black spring game. You know, it's going to be interesting to see how how it all unfolds here. Yeah, I'm, I'm super pumped. I'm definitely going to make my way to the spring game this year because there's just so many new pieces, and they're not going to show much. But at the same time, it's it's fun to see live action, and I can't wait for football season. You know, once basketball ends, I love baseball, but I'm already doing my fantasy football research. I'm doing my Gamecock football research, my SEC research. Um, you know, that's the best part about summer, but yeah, um, absolutely. Well, Alex, you know, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you hopping on with me. I know that you're doing double and triple and quadruple duty <laughs> sometimes. So thank you so much. I'm glad the rain delay helped to get you here, but yeah. um, guys, that that's going to do it for us tonight. I really appreciate everybody for sticking around. Um, Thank you for joining us on a Tuesday. You know, normally this show is Mondays at nine o'clock. Um, had some scheduling conflicts yesterday, so couldn't make it happen. But, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I'll always remind all of you listening is you, know, you all give me the most valuable thing you have, which is your time. And I appreciate it more than you'll ever know. Um, joining me on this journey is so much fun. And I love talking Gamecock athletics with you. And I cannot wait to, um, Um, Join you guys next week. I will be on the Inside the Gamecock show tomorrow morning. So pop on there and we will make sure to have Alex back. Alex has quickly become a fan favorite. So uh, he'll have to find more time to stay up late. I know he's a bit of a night owl, but uh, we all appreciate y'all. Thank y'all so much for joining us tonight. And for Alex Jones and myself, we wish you all a great evening and we'll talk soon. Have a good one, everybody. Bye.